to thank Raycon Wireless Earbuds for supporting the Peter Schiff Show podcast. Raycon Earbuds started about half the price of any other premium wireless earbuds on the market. So go to buyraycon.com slash gold today and unlock exclusive deals of up to 20% off on your Raycon order. Offer is available for a limited time, so don't wait. Most U.S. stock market indexes finished the day in the red. Only the Russell 2000 managed to eke out a gain. On the week, it was a split picture. You had both the NASDAQ and the Russell 2000 finishing up, but the Dow and the S&P were down. In fact, this was the first down week for those indexes in three weeks. In fact, I recently read an article that showed that U.S. hedge funds have never been more net long in history than they are right now. So the guys that run the hedge funds, supposedly the smartest people in the room, have never been more optimistic and more bullish, and they are just long. So in other words, hedge funds have never been less hedged than they are today. So they're really not hedge funds at all. They are risk funds. And when everybody up is loaded up on one side of the trade, there's a pretty good indication that the markets are getting ready to move in the other direction. Of course, the one thing that is providing the impetus for all the bullishness is the Fed and the idea that QE infinity is here to stay. And that is the only thing driving stock prices. In fact, I read today, JP Morgan is now forecasting that GDP in Q1 of 2020 will be a negative number, minus 1%. Not that big a negative number, but still there's a negative instead of a positive. And of course, you know, that's annualized. So that means the actual quarterly decline in GDP is only a quarter of 1%. But if you look at JP Morgan's forecast, they think the economy is going to come roaring back in Q2 and Q3, they're looking for growth in those two quarters of four and six and a half percent respectively. Now, why is it that they believe that the economy is going to come roaring back from a contraction in Q1? Obviously, it's because of massive government stimulus that they're expecting probably even more from the Fed than from Congress, because I don't know how long it's going to take, you know, the Biden administration and Congress to actually enact uh, their initial stimulus. But you know, if we do have a negative GDP for the first quarter, that's only going to put even more political pressure on government, in particular, the Republicans in the Senate, assuming that the Republicans hold the Senate in these Georgia special elections. But it'll put even more pressure on a lot of the Republicans to compromise and to deliver more stimulus, because after all, that's what people need, and so therefore that's what the government needs to supply. So it's the anticipation of this stimulus which is driving the market. In fact, one stimulus-related discussion that I listened to on CNBC, they were trying to uh, figure out whether or not the government was going to continue with all this uh, aggressive stimulus and lending programs in the wake of uh, these vaccines, right? Once we get these COVID vaccines on the market and if they're effective and they're working and COVID is no longer, uh, you know, a threat to the economy, will the Fed continue with all the stimulus? And, you know, the, the thinking is, well, I guess they won't have to because the economy is no longer burdened uh, with COVID. But the real burden is not the COVID, but all the debt that the economy accumulated while the Fed was trying to fight COVID. It's the COVID cure that is far more harmful to the economy than the disease. So even after the disease is gone, the cure is going to linger and it's going to continue to do damage because we accumulated all this extra debt because the Fed's balance sheet is now so much bigger because the stock market bubble is now so much bigger because the real estate bubble has you know gained new strength because everybody has more leverage than they did before. And of course, the U.S. economy is going to be less efficient in this post-COVID world as U.S. companies are still going to have to be covering the costs of being able to uh, prepare uh, for the next lockdown or the next 
uh, virus that comes up. We already know what the playbook is. We know how we're going to react to it. Uh, And so these are these unknown factors that are going to be burdening American businesses for a long time. So we have a less efficient, more highly indebted, more leveraged economy that needs stimulus more than ever. We don't need the stimulus to deal with the COVID disease. We need more stimulus to deal with the COVID cure. That's what we're addicted to. We're addicted to the cure. It's not about the disease. It's all about the cure. In fact, I was even reading articles about the fact that Secretary of the Treasury Mnuchin recently announced that they're going to be dialing back their fiscal stimulus, right? They actually want some of the money back that was available uh, for these uh, loans that the U.S. government was backstopping. In fact, one of the reasons I think that the government doesn't want to fund as much of this stimulus is I read an article in the Wall Street Journal about a lot of these PPP loans. And the article focused on the fact that I think 300 or more companies that had taken out PPP loans had already gone bankrupt. And therefore, they're clearly not going to repay their loans. But of course, a lot of companies aren't going to repay their loans because as long as you didn't fire your employees, then the loans became gifts. But at least in theory, these jobs were theoretically saved uh, by these loans. Now, I I don't believe that they were. Some some jobs might have been. But the point is that the companies that went bankrupt, obviously, if they're bankrupt, well, they fired their workers. But so that means that jobs weren't saved at these companies. They went bankrupt anyway. But because they're bankrupt, the PPP loans are not going to get repaid. This is exactly what I warned was going to happen on my first podcast following the announcement of this asinine program. Because if you recall, I pointed out that one of the uh, aspects of the PPP was that none of the small businesses had to pledge any collateral for the loans or put any personal guarantees on the loans. Normally, I guess in small business loans, you have collateral, you have a personal guarantee so that you just, you know, the the small business owner can't just walk away uh, from his payment responsibility. But Congress was more concerned about getting the money out there quickly. So they didn't want to burden the banks with having to actually, you know, do any research on the loans, get any collateral, get any personal guarantees. They just wanted to make as many loans as possible as quickly as possible. So I knew this opened up a real opportunity for small business owners that knew they were going to go out of business anyway, to just borrow as much money as they could from the government and then pay out as much of that money as they can uh, to themselves before going bankrupt and then not repaying the loan. Because once the business is bankrupt, there is no recourse beyond that bankrupt company. So this really opened up uh, a, a massive uh, you know, cesspool of fraud. Now, I know in theory, maybe the government can go after people and claim, hey, you took all this money out and then you went bankrupt. But I think it's going to be very difficult to do that. I mean, obviously... Uh, people can make an argument that, you know, they didn't intend to go bankrupt and, uh, and and who knows? And there's just so many people. And I think there's safety in numbers. I think so many people took advantage of this and it's going to be relatively difficult to prove that the people who took money out intended to go bankrupt, right? They can always claim that I thought I would survive and I needed this money and, and then I ended up going bankrupt. So it doesn't surprise me that so many of these companies have already gone bankrupt. Many, many more are going to go bankrupt. Maybe to an extent this is embarrassing for the Trump administration Mnuchin. And so look, you know, the election is over. There is no second term. Uh, so, okay, let's just cut our losses on this program and not do any more. And initially, I think the market sold off a little bit on the idea that, oh, this is you know going to take away some of the stimulus from the economy. But then the markets took another look at it and decided that this is actually bullish because it puts even more pressure on the Federal Reserve to expand its QE program. After all, it's now the only one that's, you know, doing stimulus. So it has to carry the burden all by itself. So it has to step up its game. It's got to do even bigger quantitative easing than might have been the case had the government been pitching in with more fiscal stimulus. And of course, any fiscal stimulus needs to be monetized anyway. But I think what Wall Street is looking at 
is the type of stimulus that the Fed does on its own is far more effective at propping up asset prices than when we get uh, the fiscal kind. And of course, Wall Street is less worried about uh, stimulus that's targeting Wall Street and assets bleeding into consumer prices. After all, if ordinary consumers aren't getting the money, they're not using it to bid up consumer prices and then pushing up the official CPI numbers. Uh, It's just going into financial assets. So that provides more cover for the Fed to keep on doing QE. One of the things that everybody expects is for the Federal Reserve to lengthen the duration of the treasuries that it's buying. In other words, buying more longer term treasuries than short term treasuries. I mean, remember when the Fed initially started doing what everybody started calling not QE, one of the rationales that the Fed had for trying to claim that it wasn't QE was that they were focusing on shorter term maturities, not longer term maturities. Well, now they're going for longer and longer term maturities. It's my belief that eventually the Federal Reserve is going to own the entirety of the long end of the spectrum. The only U.S. Treasuries that are going to be in private hands or probably even in foreign ownership are going to be the most short maturities because nobody wants to get caught with long-term treasuries when interest rates eventually go up because if you want to bail out of your long-term treasuries, you have to sell them in the market and the market price could collapse. But of course, if you have short-term treasuries, you never have to worry about selling your treasuries. Just let the treasuries mature and the government has to pay you face value. So I think uh, the risk adverse holders are going to shorten their maturities. Obviously, that puts more upward pressure on the long end, which means in order to prevent long-term interest rates from rising, which of course the Federal Reserve wants to do, they have to buy more and more at the longer end until eventually they are going to own Uh, the entire long end. Of course, eventually they could own the whole bond market uh, throughout the curve. In fact, uh, Schiff Gold put out a very good article the other day pointing out that the Federal Reserve now owns a record percentage of U.S. Treasury debt. Prior to COVID, the Fed owned 9.3% of all the Treasuries outstanding. Now they own 16.5% and rising. In fact, if you go look at the buying in March and April, right, and that was the very beginning of of this ramped up QE, the Treasury issued $1.56 trillion in new Treasury debt. And the Federal Reserve bought $1.56 trillion of Treasuries. In other words, 100% of the U.S. government's borrowing during March and April was financed by the Federal Reserve. We monetized it all. Now, remember, the Fed continues to claim that they're not monetizing debt. I mean, that's the same bogus claim that Ben Bernanke made from the very beginning. And of course, I called him out on his BS, saying, of course, they were monetizing the debt. But Bernanke's claim that the Fed wasn't monetizing the debt rested on his claim that the bonds were only being purchased temporarily during the emergency and that the Federal Reserve was going to sell back the bonds into the market as soon as the emergency was over. Well, they tried to do that belatedly, you know, after the balance sheet, you know, got up to four and a half trillion, they finally tried to shrink it and it barely got below four trillion before they had to ramp it back up again. So clearly the U.S. government is monetizing the debt. In fact, even Powell recently had the audacity to claim that the demand for U.S. Treasuries is robust, right? When he was asked whether or not he was worried about the demand and he said, no, the demand is robust. How could it possibly be robust if the Fed is buying 100% of the debt that the U.S. government is selling? Where is all this robust demand? If there was robust demand, the Fed would not have to supply it. The reason the Federal Reserve has to buy so much uh, in U.S. Treasury debt is because demand is not robust. I mean, it's only robust from the Federal Reserve, but that means that it's not robust at all. And because there is no demand for U.S. Treasuries, the Federal Reserve is going to have to pick up the pace of buying. In fact, look at the numbers that came out yesterday. We got the Fed's balance sheet. It moved up another $67.7 billion in the most recent week. The balance sheet is now at $7.243 trillion. 
I think that's a new record. I'm not exactly sure, but it looks like the highest number I've seen. And I think we're about to move substantially higher. Look at the money supply, the weekly money supply, a huge increase in the recent week, $172.4 billion in one week added to the money supply. This is why the U.S. dollar is so weak, and it's going to get a lot weaker. But in particular, look at what's happening with the dollar versus the Chinese yuan. It had another down day and another down week. I think it closed the week at 6 spot 563 yuan to the dollar. The U.S. dollar is now down by 5.75% year to date against the Chinese yuan. We're close to a two-year low in this exchange rate, but we're headed a lot lower. Now, if the U.S. dollar is falling at that rate, why would the Chinese want to buy U.S. Treasuries, right? The U.S. Treasury, you buy a 10-year U.S. Treasury, you don't even get a 1% yield, right? The yield on a 10-year U.S. Treasury is 0.82%. So if the Chinese bought U.S. Treasuries at the beginning of the year and they're getting 0.82% yield, but the U.S. dollar has already dropped by 5.75%. What is that? Six, seven years of interest they've already lost during one year of holding on to their U.S. treasuries? And I think the pace at which the dollar is falling against the yuan is going to accelerate. So these are huge losses. Why would the Chinese want to go down with this ship when they could just get off? which is what they're doing. They are unloading U.S. Treasuries. They are not necessarily rolling over all the shorter-term debt as it matures. And other countries all around the world are doing the same thing. This is putting more and more pressure on the U.S. Federal Reserve to purchase larger and larger quantities of U.S. Treasuries. And of course, ultimately, it puts pressure on the Federal Reserve to buy larger quantities of all sorts of debt. Because if the Fed simply monetizes U.S. Treasury debt, that puts more upward pressure on corporate credit, on municipal bonds. And so if the Federal Reserve wants to keep a lid on those interest rates, which of course it does, because if those interest rates go up, that puts lots of pressure on corporations or on local governments, or if they let mortgage rates go up, that puts pressure uh, into the housing market. So the Fed ultimately has to continue to monetize everybody's debt to keep everybody's interest rates artificially low. And that just puts more downward pressure on the dollar and accelerates the desire to get out of the dollar, which means now the Fed has to print even more money to buy even more bonds. And again, the cycle continues until eventually... Uh, the dollar is going to collapse. You know, I had the debate uh, yesterday with Harry Dent on this very topic. Uh, Some of you might have listened to that. I'm not really sure if it's going to be up on the internet at some point. It was sponsored uh, by a company down in Australia. And I think people might have paid uh, to register online. We had a pretty good audience uh, for the live debate. So maybe they will replay it. But again, the the argument that I continue to have with Harry Dent is whether this bubble will implode in an inflation or a deflationary uh, dynamic. And of course, Harry Dent continues to argue that it's going to deflate where prices are going to collapse and the dollar is going to go way up. So Harry Dent's investment recommendation is buy U.S. Treasuries. I have the opposite conclusion. Because I recognize the dynamics that are different now than they were, let's say, during the 1930s when the U.S. was on a gold standard. If you want to price uh, assets and consumer goods in gold, which is how they were priced in the 1930s, even though they were priced in dollars, the dollar was fixed uh, to gold. If you're going to you know, measure prices in gold again today, then I agree with Harry. Prices are going to collapse in terms of gold in the U.S., but they're certainly not going to collapse in terms of Federal Reserve notes because I believe the Federal Reserve will create enough money to prevent that from happening. They will stop the nominal collapse in asset prices or goods prices, but they will cause an even bigger collapse in real terms pricing those assets and goods in gold. So if you hide out in U.S. Treasuries, you get wiped out. That's not a safe haven. The real safe haven would be real money, which would be 
gold and also by diversifying outside of U.S. assets, owning real assets, real companies outside the United States that pay good dividends. And while I'm on the topic of gold, I may as well uh, talk about fool's gold, a.k.a. Bitcoin. Bitcoin continues its spectacular rise. I think it almost got up to 19,000 earlier today. I don't recall the precise high. I don't think it hit 19,000, but it came damn close. As I'm recording this podcast now, it's around 18,600, 18,700. So pretty close uh, to the highs. And of course, we're very close to the all-time record high that Bitcoin set back in uh, the end of 2017. So almost back to where we were three years ago. And again, remember, there was all sorts of Uh, optimism and bullishness when Bitcoin did get near 20,000 three years ago. Uh, Very few uh, Bitcoin proponents expected it to crash back down near 3,000, but that's exactly what it did. And so now we're back up in the vicinity of those highs and just about nobody expects another collapse. Pretty much everybody into Bitcoin assumes that Getting above 20,000 is a foregone conclusion. In fact, it's going to be the breakout, which is going to launch uh, Bitcoin to a much higher level. In fact, I think the bullishness that I am seeing in the financial media regarding Bitcoin is stronger than what I remember three years ago. I remember like CNBC, you know, kind of jumped on the Bitcoin bandwagon as it was, you know, approaching 20,000 and they got bullish. But I think back then they had more bears. There were more people on CNBC kind of casting doubt on the legitimacy of Bitcoin and and talking about it as a bubble and tulip mania and stuff like that. Not anymore. It is very rare to see any negative coverage of Bitcoin anywhere in financial media. In fact, I think it's funny because I was watching a uh, reading on the internet And there was a story uh, that came out from Fox Business that was negative on Bitcoin, right? And it quoted me, it it quoted Rubini, it quoted Dalio. uh, And so the the title was negative for Bitcoin. And so I immediately read a lot of people in the Bitcoin community saying, aha, here comes the FUD, right? The mainstream media is out there bashing Bitcoin. They don't want anyone to buy it. They're threatened by it. So they're sending out these big guns to try to convince people not to buy it, right? See, this is what we're going to get. This is what you expect. Don't believe the media, right? It's all a bunch of fraud. They just don't want you to get rich. They want to protect their buddies in the banks. And of course, this is complete nonsense because barely any articles are negative. I mean, there was another negative article supposedly in the Financial Times and I read it and you know what? It actually was kind of sympathetic to Bitcoin, even though it was sort of negative, it was still very sympathetic. But I mean, that was a rare exception. Most of the coverage is extremely bullish. I can't even watch CNBC without seeing a commercial for Grayscale. I mean, they're on every single break, every single commercial break. I don't think there's ever a break that doesn't include uh, that commercial. I mean, it is a massive pump going on on these commercials being supported uh, by these news stories. In fact, even that Fox business news story, if you see it on the internet, part of that story includes a video interview from Fox business with Stuart Barney. And he's interviewing some Bitcoin guy And Stuart Barney is just gushing all over Bitcoin. I mean, he's all but telling his viewers to run out and buy it. He is very, very pro-Bitcoin, no skepticism at all. And they're talking about supposedly Citibank had some call that Bitcoin was going to hit 300,000 by next year in 2021. That's more than 10 times the current price. And they were ascertaining or discussing rather this forecast as if it was very credible and very realistic. I mean, it wasn't like pie in the sky. Oh yeah, oh, it's just gonna really you can go to 300,000. Oh wow, that's fantastic. I mean, this is crazy coverage. I mean, the media is basically in love with Bitcoin. I've never seen them this excited about anything really since the dot-com days, right? When they were really excited about a lot of these stocks that ultimately went to zero, they're even more excited now about Bitcoin than they were about those stocks during that bubble. In fact, 
all news is good news when it comes to Bitcoin. I'm seeing more and more people trying to claim that the fact that Google search results for Bitcoin and buy Bitcoin and how to buy Bitcoin have not moved up at all. That they're nowhere near where they were in 2017. They're the same as they were a year ago, two years ago, four years ago, five years ago. That there is no new interest among the public in buying Bitcoin. And what they're saying is, oh, this is a great sign. See, this shows that it's not a bunch of speculation, right? So when Bitcoin went up to 20,000 three years ago, it was all this crazy speculation because so many people were researching it and buying it. But now, because you don't have all these people searching for Bitcoin and how to buy Bitcoin, we don't have all this new money coming in. It's not a speculative bubble, right? This is real demand because it's not you know, a crazed public just jumping on a bandwagon. Of course, this is complete nonsense because if you remember three years ago when a Google search traffic was rising, everybody was claiming that that's why you should be bullish because after all, more people were getting interested in Bitcoin. So that means more people would be adopting it. It's going more mainstream. So back then they argued that the growing Google searches was a bullish sign. Now the same people are arguing that the lack of growth in Google searches is also a bullish sign. The reality is they were right back then. I mean, it is bullish if you have new players entering a pyramid scheme because that's the only way pyramids can keep going. Pyramids need new buyers to bring in new money so that the earlier people can get out. But if we don't have a lot of new people coming into the market, then how do you keep the thing going? So the fact that we're not seeing a broadening of the Bitcoin market is not a bullish sign. I mean, what's really going on is the same people who were buying a few years ago are just buying more. It's not that there's a lot of more converts. It's just that the same people who were very enthusiastic a few years ago are just as enthusiastic now. And so maybe they're putting uh, more money into Bitcoin and they're averaging up their price. But there's no way that this is a bullish sign, yet in a bull market, every sign is bullish. Everything gets spin in a positive way, and that's exactly what's going on with Bitcoin. Now, I don't know whether or not Bitcoin is going to get above 20,000. I'd have to guess, based on how close we are, that the odds are that we will, but I seriously doubt a move above 20,000 will be sustained. I would imagine that there'll be massive selling at some point and it's going to drop like a rock. And it's possible that we don't even get there because so many people assume that it's a foregone conclusion that we will. You know, markets tend to find a way to disappoint the most number of people. And since just about everybody who owns Bitcoin, you know, believes that this is a sure thing, well, the market has a way of disappointing people who are that. Uh, optimistic and that sure of what's going to happen. And you know, one of the other ironic things about the media's love affair with Bitcoin is if you look at a lot of these commentators who just love Bitcoin and think everything is great, these are mainstream guys. I mean, these are not guys who are bearish on the U.S. stock market or the economy. They're not critics of fiat money or the central banks or the Fed. In fact, you know, they, they, they think the Fed is great. They think fiat money is great. They, you know, they, they would never be buying gold because they think, well, gold's a waste of money. Why would you want to buy that? Gold doesn't pay any interest. It's just metal. It just sits there. You know, be in the stock market, be in the bond market, be in real estate. Everything is great. You're just a gloom and doomer, right? Every time I came on and tried to make arguments about why you need to own some gold, I mean, they jumped all over me. But people now come up and talk about Bitcoin. They make the exact same arguments that I made for gold, only now they're making those arguments for Bitcoin. And all of a sudden, oh yeah, that's great. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, buy Bitcoin. This whole thing is ridiculous. If they are really going to be this bullish on Bitcoin, they need to be bearish on everything else. They have to understand what this means, right? If fiat currencies are really going to collapse, if we're really going to have hyperinflation, they need to change their outlook on everything else. They can't be bullish on stocks and bullish on bonds and also bullish on Bitcoin. Also expect Bitcoin to go to a million, right? There, there, there is so much inconsistency here. So this, this bubble has basically, you know, uh, captured a large group of people. I mean, it is so intoxicating. You know, I, I tweeted out today a survey and I know already what the results are going to be because all the Bitcoiners troll my Twitter account. But tulip mania happened almost 400 years ago. You know, the Dutch tulip craze. 
Yet everybody still knows about it today, 400 years later. It's still one of the best examples, if not the best example, of you know popular delusions and the madness of crowds. I mean, that was the name of the book that that that, that really wrote about it. It's a great book. If you haven't read it, even that book was written, you know, what, in the 1850s or something. So that book itself is old, but people still know about tulip mania. Uh, my question would be, in 400 years, will people still be talking about Bitcoin mania? Will Bitcoin actually replace the tulip bulb as the quintessential bubble? When people study financial bubbles and manias, is it all going to be about Bitcoin? Are people going to forget about the tulip bulb? Because personally, I think this is a much better example of that dynamic. And, uh, you know, the, the, the hubris and the irrational exuberance that, you know, that, that typifies any kind of mania or bubble. I think this is a far better example. As funny as the, the tulip bulb craze was, I think this beats it. I think tulip bulbs, you can make a better argument to support the value of a tulip bulb than you can to support the value of Bitcoin. Yet people can look back at the tulip mania and, 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 and learn nothing with respect to Bitcoin. They, you know, everybody in Bitcoin knows about tulip mania and they say, oh, those comparisons are ridiculous. Bitcoin isn't a tulip. That's right. A tulip has more value than Bitcoin. You know, it's never too early to start shopping for the holidays, especially because today you can save big on the gift they'll use every day. I'm talking Raycon wireless earbuds. You know, I used to use a more expensive brand of earbuds until I found Raycon or Raycon found me and I gave these things a try and they are every bit as good as the more expensive pair that I had already bought, but they're available for a lot less money. And they're actually very easy to use. Even my seven-year-old Preston was able to figure out how to use them. He's always asking to borrow mine. In fact, I got to get him his own pair. Uh, but a lot of times when I'm looking for them, you know, they're up in his room because he he likes them. And if a seven-year-old can figure out how to use them, well, then anybody can do it. Unlike some of your other wireless options, Raycon earbuds are both stylus and discreet. They've got no dangling wires or stems to distract anyone uh, during video calls. So give them a try. Raycon has a 45-day free return policy. So after you buy them, you can make sure that they're the pair for you. And if they're not, just send them back. With seamless Bluetooth pairing and a comfortable noise isolating fit, you can start listening right away and keep listening for hours. In fact, it's a great way to listen to the Peter Schiff Show podcast. The audio quality is amazing, comparable to what you get from other premium brands, except Raycon started half the price. So this holiday season, get them something that they can use for calls or music, listening to the Peter Schiff Show podcast for work, for play, at home or on the go, or pick up a pair for yourself. You're going to use them every day. So go to buyraycon.com slash gold today to unlock exclusive deals of up to 20% off on your Raycon order. But hurry, this offer is available for a limited time only, so you don't want to miss it. But I want to finish up this podcast on a more serious note, and I want to talk about an announcement that President Trump made today regarding his efforts to use the force of government to mandate lower prices for prescription drugs, right? And he is doing this through an executive order. Now, number one, I think the whole executive order is unconstitutional. There's nothing in the U.S. Constitution that gives the U.S. government the authority to tell drug companies what they can charge for their products. They don't have the authority to tell any company what they can charge for their products. Prices should be determined by supply and demand. It's got nothing to do with government. Yet uh, President Trump is deciding to pass laws uh, dictating what drug companies can charge. Now, of course, if the U.S. government by decree can do this to drug companies, well, they could do it to any company, right? Once you say the government has the power to impose price limits on one good, well, they can impose them on any good they want. Right? It's, it's the principle that's important. So this is a very bad precedent. Not that we haven't had this before. I mean, we had wage and price controls in the past. You know, we had them uh, under Richard Nixon. I mean, they were unconstitutional then. They're unconstitutional now. But this also shows you, if anybody is still harboring delusions that Donald Trump is a free market guy, a conservative guy, he's not. There actually is a conservative free market way to lower drug prices. Yet Trump doesn't want to go down that route. He wants to go down the socialist route 
not the free market route. And I'm going to explain that in a minute. But first, what I want to focus on is the irony of how this is going to backfire. And this is often the case, almost always the case, with any government program or regulation. Whatever the intended effect is, the actual result is the opposite. So Trump's uh, executive order is designed to reduce the price that Americans pay for prescription drugs. The actual effect of the regulations is going to be to increase the price that Americans pay for prescription drugs. So because of this executive order, the price of prescription drugs in America is going to be higher than would have been the case absent the executive order. Now, of course, by the time the impact is really felt by the American consumer, Trump won't be in office anymore, right? It's going to be Biden's problem. But I doubt Biden, you know, big government liberal Biden will have the guts to reverse this executive order. Because after all, the public believes that the executive order means they're going to pay lower prices. They're not going to realize that that executive order is the reason prices are even higher than what they remember. They'll think they're getting some kind of benefit. So there's no way Biden is going to undo this. So we're probably stuck with it, which means American consumers are going to be stuck paying much higher prices for prescription drugs than they would have paid because they were going to pay high prices anyway, except now they're going to be even higher. So what I'm going to do now is explain this because you're not going to read this anywhere. I'm sure most people won't be discussing it. Uh, You know, that's why you got to listen to podcasts like mine. And that's why you've got to recommend that your friends tune in so they actually understand the basics of economics. So there are two ways that Donald Trump is promising to use government decrees to lower the price of a product. One of them had to do with cutting out the middlemen. Donald Trump claims that there are these middlemen in the pharmaceutical industry that are just taking this money and that money could have otherwise gone to the consumer. But these middlemen are in there just jacking up prices for no reason, taking a big piece of the action for themselves and and, and leaving the consumer to pay higher prices. So what he's saying is the government is going to legislate the middleman out. And all that savings, right, from not from cutting out the middleman, right, everybody wants to cut out the middleman, right? So all the savings from cutting out the middleman are now going to be passed on to the consumer. And so the consumer is going to get lower prices because there's not going to be a middleman there uh, in the way of screwing things up. Well, think about this for a minute. There are middlemen all over the U.S. economy, right? All industries have... Uh, a certain number of middlemen between the producer and the end consumer. Now, if all these middlemen were doing is running up the prices, right? If they were making markets less efficient and if they were resulting in higher prices, the free market would squeeze these middlemen out all by itself. Free market competition would get rid of middlemen if all middlemen were doing is raising prices without providing any value for their service. The fact of the matter is a lot of these middlemen are there because they actually make markets more efficient. They actually overall reduce costs. That's how they have a job. They're able to interpose themselves in a way to reduce prices. That's how they justify their role. If they were just causing prices to go up, I mean, they they would be squeezed out. So the idea that all these middlemen are just running up prices and that it's government, not the free market, that's going to reduce prices is absurd. So the, the, the more likely outcome is that whatever Donald Trump is trying to do to get rid of middlemen that were probably in there for a reason, they were probably doing something to reduce the overall distribution costs throughout the network to just force them out by government decree. Well, now whatever job they were doing to lower prices isn't going to be done. So it's very possible that the result will be higher prices. But I think that is just a small part of the problem. I think it's the second aspect that, and this is the one that Trump is far more proud about, and he's bragging about this. This is the one that's going to do the most damage. And this is pure politics, right? This is all about smoke and mirrors. This is all about uh, form over substance. It, it's how things appear versus how things are. Now, we all know that a lot of U.S. drug companies 
sell drugs abroad. The exact same drugs that they're selling in America, they sell them in foreign markets at much lower prices. In fact, Donald Trump talked about the fact that in some cases, the prices that U.S. drug companies charge in America are five times higher than what they charge in other countries. And so what Trump is imposing is this most favored nation rule. And what he's saying is that America has to be given the lowest price, not the highest price, meaning whatever the cheapest price is, a drug company sells its drugs in a foreign country. It can't sell it for a higher price in America. It has to at least match the best price that it gives any other country. Now, I did read some of the fine print, and so it's not quite as draconian as that, in that there is the ability you can uh, adjust it for relative GDP uh, and other factors. So it doesn't have to be the identical price in nominal terms, but there is going to be a way to adjust it. And then the U.S. government is going to force the drug companies to give the U.S. consumer the best deal, right? And another adjustment you know, has to do with, with bulk sales because a lot of the sales that U.S. drug companies make abroad are bulk. You know, they're bulk sales to foreign governments that have national health uh, uh, plans that they're buying for. And so it's a big bulk purchase. And obviously, when you're buying something in bulk, you can get a lower unit cost. So I think there's some way uh, to adjust for that. But the net result of this is not going to be that Americans all of a sudden see an 80% reduction in their drug prices, right? If, if a drug company was charging a foreign country uh, one-fifth of what it charged America, it, the, the drug company is just not going to slash its prices uh, to the United States. There is a reason for this. And believe it or not, and I'm going to explain why right now, the ability to sell drugs at a low price internationally actually results in Americans paying lower prices for these drugs than they otherwise would have paid without these foreign sales. Now, Americans are still paying high prices, but the prices would be even higher if it wasn't for these lower cost sales abroad. See, here is the problem. The United States has the most expensive regulations. It is more costly to bring a drug to market for the U.S. than for any other country. I mean, one of the big problems, too, is that U.S. companies, not only do these drug companies have to prove that their drugs don't hurt you, right, that they don't have any harmful side effects, they also have to prove efficacy, right? They have to prove that the drugs work. You know, they're not going to leave it up to the doctor and the patient to just, hey, here's a drug. It's not going to hurt you. So, you know, if you want to use it, you could use it. If you think it's going to work, try it. If not, don't, right? The government doesn't leave it to the free market. The government says, we're not going to let a drug on the market unless the drug company proves to us with all these studies that the drug is effective, right? And these studies are insanely expensive. It costs a tremendous amount of money to develop these drugs. And therefore, these pharmaceutical companies have to charge a tremendous amount of money to recoup their costs. Otherwise, they wouldn't front the money to do all these studies if they couldn't recoup their investment. Now, what happens is once you have a drug, right, and you've produced it and you've had that sunk cost, I mean, you can sell extra units. The marginal cost of running off extra pills or whatever serum is tiny, right? So the extent that they can sell some of their drugs offshore, that's going to help defray the cost of developing those drugs. Now, of course, pharmaceutical companies, they want to get as much money as possible for their drugs, but they're subject to a lot of competition. Because if you're trying to sell your drugs into another country that doesn't have anywhere near the onerous requirements in order to bring that drug to market, now the U.S. is in competition with other drug companies that don't have anywhere near as high a cost to develop their drugs as our companies had to develop our drugs. So in order to make the sale, the U.S. manufacturer has to really cut the price. Because if it doesn't cut the price, it's not going to sell any drugs and it's not going to get any revenue at all. And of course, a lot of times these governments that are buying, they have certain budgets. And if you can't meet the budget, you're not going to get the sale. The sale is going to go to another company that can come in under budget. So what happens is if you mandate U.S. drug makers and say, hey, you can't charge Americans any more than you charge anybody else adjusted for these few things, 
All you're doing is you're negating the ability of U.S. drug companies to compete internationally in foreign markets. And so those sales are going to dry up. They, they just can't raise their prices. Now, obviously, one thing they can do is say, OK, we're just going to raise the prices that we're charging to other countries. So if we were charging a certain country, you know, 20 cents on the dollar, we're just going to increase the price of our drugs fivefold. And now Americans will be paying the same as in this other country. Well, they can't do that. If they could have increased their prices fivefold, they would have already done it. These companies are profit maximizing companies. They are already charging as much as the market will bear. So if you force them to charge more, then they're just not going to get the sale. The sale is going to go to a foreign drug company. So what's going to happen when you have all these U.S. drug companies that no longer have all this revenue uh, from uh, foreign distribution, foreign sales? Well, now they're going to have to recoup all of the cost of development from the domestic market. Whereas they used to be able to recoup some of their costs by selling internationally. Now Trump is like, well, you can't do that because you can only sell internationally if you charge the same price that you charge domestically. They can't do that. Now, of course, if they tried to lower the domestic prices to the same as uh, the foreign prices, they'd lose money. They'd go out of business. They can't do that because they would never be able to recoup their costs if they did that. So rather than lowering the price of their U.S. drugs, they just raise the price of their foreign drugs to the point where they're no longer selling internationally. Or if they do have sales, they're not selling nearly as much. And so they're not making nearly as much money internationally. Therefore, they no longer have that revenue to offset the domestic cost of developing the drugs. So now they have to raise prices in the U.S., which is a captive market where they don't have as much competition because everybody has to face the same high development costs if they want to sell their drugs in the United States. And so the U.S. has the ability to raise prices. And of course, with our health insurance system and third party payers and insurance companies paying for everything, I mean, there's not as much competition here. So it's easier for U.S. drug companies to now increase the price that they charge Americans to make up for the fact that they're not making money uh, charging foreigners. So the, the effect of all this is that Americans end up paying more. Now, it's true that foreigners won't be buying U.S. drugs on the cheap anymore, so we can feel good about that. But the net effect is that we pay even more. You see, this is the, the problem with socialism, right? You talk about, hey, we need to redistribute the wealth, right? We have this income inequality. We have some people that are really rich. That's not fair, right? So socialism wants to make it fair by heavily taxing the rich. But what happens then is when you do that and you redistribute the money, you end up redistributing the poverty rather than the wealth. So now there's less inequality, but everybody is worse off. So under capitalism, you have more inequality, but the middle class and the poor live better than under socialism where there's less inequality. But if you want to be happy about the fact that there's less inequality, even if you yourself are poorer, but what good is that? So now what this program is going to do is say, hey, this is going to be great. We're no longer going to be giving foreigners a good deal on American drugs. They're no longer going to get a free ride based on our R&D. OK, that may be true, but the net effect is not going to be that Americans pay less, which is the intent of the legislation. It's going to be that Americans pay more. So in other words, the effect, the consequence of the legislation is the opposite of what was promised, which is how government works all the time. You know, Donald Trump likes to pride himself on being a great deal maker. You know, the art of the deal is a win-win where both sides walk away and they think that they've won. Well, when it comes to this deal, this is a lose-lose. Everybody is worse off because of this executive order. Foreigners end up paying higher prices for the American drugs that they buy, but Americans also end up paying higher prices for the American drugs that we buy. So everybody loses. Donald Trump succeeds in one order in making everyone all over the world have to pay higher prices for prescription drugs. In fact, another example of this, or, or not you know, precise example, but about the, the high cost of bringing uh, a drug to market in the United States. I talked about this on the podcast a while ago when I talked about sunscreen, right? There are these new types of sunscreen, although they're not nearly as new anymore. And I forget what these ingredients are, but these ingredients do an excellent job of protecting you from the UV rays that cause skin cancer. 
So great news, right? We can we can have less skin cancer because we now have sunscreen that is a more effective uh, form of protection, right? And that would it would be great, obviously, in America because America we have more skin cancer than anybody else. So hallelujah, this is fantastic news. Now Americans who get a lot of skin cancer now they can put on better sunscreen and that will dramatically reduce uh, the incidence of skin cancer. Except these sunscreens are available every place in the world except the United States. They're not legally allowed to be sold in the U.S. Why is that? Well, because it's a drug. Because it has these ingredients, it's considered a drug. And so the FDA needs to approve it. But in order to get it approved in the United States, it's going to cost a fortune. And no sunscreen manufacturer wants to pay the money. They don't think it's worth it because they're just selling sunscreen. I mean, how much could you charge for it, even if it's better? I mean, how much more could you actually charge for the sunscreen because it has these ingredients? So because there's not enough money for any one company to recoup the cost of, of doing all the testing to get it approved, nobody wants to do it. And so Americans cannot buy, at least legally anyway, these sunscreens. And so Americans have to use inferior sunscreens and keep getting skin cancer at a higher incident rate than people in other countries who are allowed to choose to buy the sunscreen because the governments in those other countries didn't have the regulations. In fact, when I first talked about this on my podcast, one of my listeners from Israel sent me a bunch of Israeli sunscreen, which of course had the ingredients that I needed. And I I still use uh, that sunscreen. I mean, these sunscreens are very good, but it proves the point that we are keeping these products off the market because of the high cost of, uh, of getting government approval. Which brings me to what Donald Trump could have actually done. See, if Donald Trump really wanted to reduce the cost of prescription drugs to Americans, he could have streamlined the FDA approval process. One of the things that he could have done and he should have done is eliminate the requirement to prove efficacy. You know, that requirement wasn't always there. I forget when they added it. But initially, in order to get a drug approved, all you had to do was prove that it didn't hurt. It didn't do any harm, right? And then people were free to try it if they wanted to. You didn't have to force these companies to spend hundreds of millions of dollars proving that it worked. As long as they could prove that it didn't hurt you, you know, doctors could prescribe it. If they thought it worked, if patients wanted to give it a try, they could buy it. And so because it was so much less expensive to get these drugs approved, the companies didn't have to charge as much because they didn't have this huge cost that they had to recoup, this huge investment up front. And of course, remember, most of the drugs don't even get approved. It's so expensive. And a lot of these drugs that they think are going to work, and maybe they do work, they just can't prove that they do to the government's satisfaction. And so they never actually get approved. So the drugs that do get approved have to make enough money, not only to pay for the cost of developing those drugs, but of developing all the drugs that never got approved. So you develop a drug and you can never bring it to market. And let's say you spend a few hundred million dollars developing a drug and you can never sell any of it. Well, you've lost all that money. Now you finally get a drug that works. Not only do you have to recoup the cost of that drug, but you have to recoup the cost of the other drugs that didn't work. Because, you know, you have all these drugs in the pipeline. You don't really know which one is going to work. So you have to test, you know, a whole bunch of them. And then the one that works has to pay for all the costs of all the ones that didn't. So if we reduce those costs, if we don't force drug companies to waste so much money on unnecessary tests, well, the price of drugs is going to come way down. That's something that Trump could have done, but he didn't do that. You know, and of course, another thing that he could have done is introduce more free market competition uh, in drugs, uh, maybe allowing individuals to buy drugs, you know, not through their insurance companies, but directly uh, maybe making it so money that you spend uh, on drugs, if you buy it, the, the money won't be taxed so that maybe the insurance that you have, you can buy insurance without a prescription drug plan because you can buy prescription drugs with the same tax savings that you would have got had you had, you know, employer provided insurance. And now maybe you have more uh, 
pressure to shop around, to buy generics when they're uh, available. You know, when you have these prescription drug plans through your insurance company, who gives a damn? The cost of drugs are actually so low, uh, you know, once the insurance company picks up most of the cost, it doesn't even matter, right? But if you're actually buying the prescription drugs yourself and paying the full cost, well, then you have more of a reason to shop around. And if the people who are selling the drugs know that the customers are more price sensitive, well, there's going to be a better buy. But if it's all the insurance companies and you have third-party payers, uh, then you lose those free market dynamics. So there are real free market solutions that involve getting the government out of the way and introducing free market forces to lower prices of prescription drugs. I mean, that is the beauty of capitalism in the free market. It is the best way to increase quality and lower costs. But instead of a free market approach, Donald Trump wants to take a government approach. He wants to use the heavy hand of government rather than the invisible hand of the free market to force drug companies to charge lower prices. Well, we know what's going to happen when governments do that. It's going to backfire. I mean, if you could just force companies to charge lower prices, why stop it? Drugs, prescription drugs. I mean, wouldn't we like to buy everything cheaper? Why doesn't Donald Trump require all companies that are providing goods and services to give us lower prices, right? Wouldn't that be great? Then we can win on everything. The reason they can't do that is because it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work for other consumer goods, it's not going to work for prescription drugs. And yet another problem from this executive order is that America's trade deficit is going to go up. Because if U.S. drug companies are not able to sell their drugs internationally or if their sales internationally are greatly diminished because they have to charge much higher prices than they would have charged absent these rules and therefore they sell uh, a lot smaller quantity and don't make nearly as much money, that reduces our exports and therefore increases our trade deficit, which then puts more downward pressure on the dollar because the bigger the trade deficits are, the more dollars are out there in the global market. Some of those dollars had been being used to buy U.S. drugs. But if American companies can no longer sell those drugs, then those surplus dollars just end up getting dumped in the foreign exchange markets, putting more downward pressure on the dollar, putting more upward pressure on domestic inflation and more upward pressure on interest rates, putting more pressure on the Fed to print more money to prevent interest rates from going up and just adding fuel to that fire. (laughs) 